Yeah. All right, there you guys are. Right there. Oh, yeah, I'll get you on the way out. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Can you hear me right now? Okay, he's going to plug it in when he gets up. Uh, let's look at our listing today. Uh, Nancy Giles requests prayers for her sister-in-law. She lost her brother to COVID, and her sister-in-law still has it, but she's getting better. Uh, Clayton Dodd, friend, passed from her uh, first test. No problems were found. She has a second test on Tuesday. Thank you for your prayers. Sarah requests prayers for Billy and Lavana. Lavana. Um, I, I knew someone named Lavana. Oh, Lavana. Uh, and so every time I start to say that, I say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Billy and Lavana Clinton, who are recovering from COVID. Oh, and Lavana is now in hospice care oh, wow. uh, because of, of the cancer surgery that she had. And uh, she, uh, uh, I think we learned that she, at about two weeks ago, had from two weeks to two months, you know, the, uh, so she, she's kind of the, like, like so many moms, she's the glue of the family, you know. The, yeah, uh, no. that's too bad. Thank you for telling us that. Yeah. Eric Chapman requests <coughs> prayers for his sister, Deborah Lamell. Lee Jones has been sick and requests prayers. Kelly Presidnik <coughs> requests prayers for Maria Fernandez, a fellow teacher who was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer, and she has started treatment. Um, Sunday, they, Sunday morning, they said, uh, Sarah Nolan is in JPS. <coughs> Someone said they thought maybe she was back home. Does anybody know? Yeah. I she is she back is. home. Okay. <coughs> uh, but we still want to remember her, of course. Angela Smith requests prayers for the Carson family. And Steve Carson passed away Friday from lung complications. <coughs> Recovering from surgery. Uh, now is Jamie Balch and Sharon Nolan and Ann Ritchie. And we're glad to, again, to have uh, Jamie and Pam back. <coughs> I asked Pam if she was going to stay with uh, today for the quilting, for the little baby quilt. And she said she forgot her fingernail polish, but she was going to come and do <laughs> the folding. So we're glad that she's able to do that. Uh, undergoing chemotherapy and radiation is Sarah Fallis' friend, Kathy Newhouse, Clayton Dodd's sister-in-law, Carol Bettis, Jack Presednik's friend, Corbin Henderson, uh, who is undergoing intensive treatment. Uh, we still have a list of um, different ones that we need to remember in our prayers. Um, I'm sure that most of you that were here Sunday morning know that Glory lost a, a cousin to a murder in Puerto Rico. And so we certainly want to remember her and just always list to others to uh, do also. Our prayer this morning is going to be said by Mamie at the proper time, and our song will be led by Julie. Uh, sympathy extended, Nancy Giles' brother, John Lancaster passed away Friday, November <coughs> 5th. Arrangements are pending. Our sincere sympathy goes to Nancy and the family. Uh, and then uh, the next one is the one I just told about uh, Gloria's cousin. Um, there's a thank you in here. In fact, we have three, and we'll do it very, very quickly. To our dear Christian family, Thank all of you once again for all your prayers on my behalf. I'm doing great and feeling stronger each day. Your beautiful cards, phone calls, and words of encouragement have meant so much to both Marvin and I. 
It's been so good to be back in worship services again and see everyone. Thank you again for everything. Love in Christ, Martin and Jamie. And uh, this is one from Pam, dear Bridgeport. Thank you so much for the cards and prayers for my knee surgery. I'm doing great. I love my Bridgeport family, Pam. Uh, and then this last one. Dear Bridgeport, <coughs> thank you for your prayers for our sister Sheila Tom Thomas in uh, <coughs> The doctors found no cancer. The test was misread. Thank you. Angela Smith. Uh, does anyone else have an announcement they would like to make? Okay, John. I have a prayer request. Okay. I just got a message from my little co worker. Her grandmother passed away. They were extremely close. And this is going to be a great big void in her life and in her mom's life. And I'd appreciate prayers for that family. Okay. Okay. And okay. Maybe. Maybe you heard what she said. Did what? Did you hear what she said? Mm -hmm. What Johnny said? Okay. 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 If there's nothing else, I'm going to uh, turn that over to Julie. Okay. Seven thirty-two. Seven three eight. Uh, computer up here because I'm not sure if I 
having the PowerPoint would help all that much and what we're going to do today. And Brienne is here. Oh, so you have an all day today. And Jean is here. And Pam, Pam, other Pam is here. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Pam, Pam is here. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, uh, this looks good to look out here and see a few more of you because we, we were down to six one day. And so, uh, and uh, today we are in, uh, uh, and I, for some strange reason, I looked over my notes last night, put them in a folder, but forgot to put them in my bag and grab my bag this morning. And guess what? Some of my additional notes were not there. What we are using today, though, uh, because we have been in Chapter 5 and kind of in introducing Chapter 6, the idea that we need to grow and so on. And uh, we'll be looking at, and some of you have this and some of you may not. And I had a copy of it with some notes written on it at home and it's still at home. Uh, the things uh, to continue to think about as we uh, study from Hebrews, uh, you know, making application to our lives and helping us uh, to help not only ourselves, but to help others to grow in Christ, because that's uh, one of the responsibilities, as he said here, when you ought to be teachers. And we made the point that all of us teach in some way. And so we ought to grow so that we help others as we grow. Um, and we were uh, basically on numbers four and five that we were going to look at uh, today and probably some more in uh, chapter six. But uh, let's just read again from chapter six. Uh, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God at the doctrines of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. Uh, and so let's stop there for just a, a few minutes, and then we'll get into uh, uh, verses 4 and following. But uh, as I have noted here, Christianity, like any other discipline, has basic, basic elementary principles. Uh, and we should not just stay on those elementary principles forever. Uh, you know, we, we need to, to grow. And I thought it was interesting here, uh, he mentions the doctrine of baptisms. And note that it's plural. Um, and uh, we, we have talked in, uh, in fact, uh, Sunday from uh, the book of Acts on John's baptism, you know, and uh, then there is also mentioned the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there's mentioned the baptism of fire, and then, of course, Paul said there is one baptism, and that's the baptism that we see illustrated throughout the book of Acts, the baptism in water for the remission of sins. And I may have mentioned this last week, I don't know, it may, it may have been that I just was thinking about mentioning it, but uh, sometimes people will ask us, well, what about John's baptism? And they're only asking, or at least this is my, my feeling, uh, you know, I'm talking about people that we are trying to teach or something, that it may be trying to get us off track uh, in regard to the baptism and water for the remission of sins. Because John's baptism is no longer in effect. And since it isn't, uh, you know, it's helpful to understand it. You know, it's helpful to understand why the baptism was, and, and as John preached Sunday night, you know, to, to know that if our baptism is not in harmony with what is in effect now, then uh, we need to be baptized. But uh, I, I have an aunt that almost every time we get close to talking about anything religious, she wants to know about John's baptism. And I, I just want to say, well, 
what difference does it make right now? <laughs> you know, uh, but maybe I can after uh, the, our discussion Sunday and uh, Sunday night in the lesson, maybe I can take that and say, well, you know, those people were baptized when they learned, you know, so we need to, and maybe I can take it and do that uh, with it. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be down there this coming weekend. In fact, I think the next three weekends we're going to be gone. And we'll be down there this coming weekend. And if I see her, maybe if she mentions that, I can turn it around. Uh, but uh, we had talked about uh, some of these things that repentance, you know, is basic to uh, becoming a Christian. Faith in Christ is basic to becoming a Christian, uh, you know, and in, in relating to baptism. Again, that's basic. And we talked about last time how that Paul would always call us back to our baptism. You know, when he was writing to Christians, he would say, this is what your baptism means, and so on. And then the fact of laying on of hands, you know, that uh, to impart spiritual gifts or gain to ministry, and all of that has ended, as we know. And uh, resurrection is also fundamental to our faith. But I, I wanted to discuss here and we'll talk about this some um, uh, because I know you have had uh, some interaction with people who uh, think that once you're saved that's it you're always saved mm -hmm. it's impossible verse 4 it's impossible for those who were once enlightened you see he uh, he's connecting that uh, He's connecting that back to what he's just said. Uh, you know, the, the idea of growing and going on to perfection. And he says, for it is impossible for, uh, for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So let's just think about that for a while, because don't we have friends or acquaintances who believe once saved, that's it, always saved? Yes. A friend of mine, one day we kind of got into that conversation, and she and she was raised in Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And she's going to a totally different kind of church now. And she said, it's not, the, she said, you don't lose your salvation. You're just a little lower on the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, so I dropped the subject and we changed the yeah. conversation completely. Well, and you know, this is, this is what I, uh, I happen to hear this, that, uh, oh, why not? I think it was while Gary was on this trip, and I, I was. Uh, sometimes I listen to some of the sermons that are on, you know, or some of the uh, religious channels just to see what's going on. And it was this uh, Charles Stanley, I believe is his name. Uh, and and sometimes he has some, you know, good life lessons and all. But he was talking about this. And, and that was the way he, he kind of said, he didn't say you're lower on the ladder, but he did say you can't lose your salvation. God gives it to you, and you can't lose it. And so God will discipline you when you, uh, you know, to bring you back to, uh, to where you ought to be. And does God discipline us? We're, we're going to learn that for sure in, in Hebrews 12. Yes, he does discipline us. And he disciplines those that he loves. And sometimes that discipline hurts. But he disciplines those whom he loves. Just like 
our parents disciplined us because they loved us. We, at least, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I, a little bit like Booker. Sometimes if y'all have heard him talk about his uh, grandmother and mother's discipline, but uh, yeah, we are disciplined. But he, he kept saying, you, you don't lose that salvation. You don't lose uh, your salvation. And in here, and then I read something, I, oh, oh yeah, I've got some notes down here that I just wanted, because sometimes if we understand how they phrase it, maybe we can help them learn. Um, so I, I have down here under number five, one commentator said this, you know, that elect, of course, they are not. So he makes a di distinction here on these people that the Hebrew writer is talking about. They had come into the church, you know, they had been baptized, and they are, they, he ha has basically two groups of people here. The elect out of the group that we, that we would consider saved. There are the saved people that can fall away, and then there are the elect that can't fall. Does that? Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? That he's saying? <laughs> uh, to put it in, uh, bring in, uh, to put it in set notation, like like a mathematic mathematician would. We've got this big set of people who uh, are saved. And within that set, though, there's the elect. And so the people that can be lost and that can't be removed weren't in this elect group. Got it? Sure. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of, that's what he's saying. Where does the Bible make a distinction between the elect of God and the saved? Do you know what? Now, in Romans, he does talk about elect. Anyway. And uh, uh, in Ephesians, he talks about being predestined according to uh, God's eternal purpose. But, you know, they, but anyway, let's go on to read this. Elect, of course, they are not. Or they would not fall away by the very force of the term. But this is one among many passages wherein the scripture, as ever from the teaching of the church, we learn that elect and regenerate are not convertible terms. They're not equal. You know, you can be regenerated, but not elect. <laughs> yeah. All elect are regenerate, but all regenerate are not elect. All saved are saved, but are not all saved are saved. <laughs> the regenerate may fall away, but the elect never can. So he's having to make a distinction within there that is, but you know, I, I pulled this out. I think this was in, uh, and I told y'all last time to make a note of the fact that this is what the uh, uh, once they've always said good Calvinists say. And a ton of people out there buy into some form of this doctrine. A ton of people. I, I was on my way home from my, uh, oh, yeah, from the, uh, a retreat several years ago out in uh, in uh, Denver, and uh, the retreat had been on the book of Ephesians, and uh, I had to cover Ephesians chapter two. But anyway, I was on my way home, and I was on Delta because we had flyer miles, and I could go uh, out there on those miles. And anyway, I I uh, had to change planes in Salt Lake City, and from Salt Lake City on back to Fort Worth, there was a woman sitting beside me. And she had her Bible out and was reading it, and I had mine out and was reading it. Her Bible was really marked up, you know, like she was a, a real student of the Word. And um, so we 
uh, entered into conversation, and her her two big points was inherited sin. Yep. And I, I I asked her if she had children, and she said yes. And I said, well, when you looked at your your baby, she had a son, I think. She, I said, when you looked at that son for the first time, did you think that he was a sinner condemned to hell? And she had a hard time dealing with that, you know. But but she tried to, to say, well, yes, when he's accountable. Well, you know, he's not. But still, I, I said, if he had died in your arms right there, would he have been condemned to hell? And, you know, it was... But she was still hanging on to that, and the other thing she was hanging on to was that you cannot fall away. And we, we talked for some time, but it was just like I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it was really, I, 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 uh, I struggled with that for a long time because I thought the scripture says that, and why warn us? You know, all through the first part of Hebrews, Hasn't the writer been warning us about losing out on the, you know, some of the Israelites lost the rest? And he said, why warn if it can't happen? Uh, you know, you don't warn your kids about uh, things that can't happen. Like when you go outside and play, watch out for the helicopters. You know, helicopters are not going to, you might say, watch out for the cars. You know, for your, uh, but you don't warn about them. But notice here, if you can get to, and, and then I have here what Albert Barnes says. says, <laughs> this passage proves that if true believers should apostatize, it would be impossible to remove and save them. If then it should be asked whether I believe that any true Christian ever did or ever will fall from grace and wholly lose his religion, I would answer unhesitatingly, no. What he's saying, if you're a true Christian and you should apostatize, it's impossible for you to come back. And since that's the case, true Christians would apostatize. You see, that doesn't even really make sense in what the scripture says here. And uh, yeah, I said these these are from uh, not Bob Milligan's, although he is named Robert Milligan, <laughs> uh, uh, his commentary on Hebrews. And I just thought that was, it, it, you know, he just noted these as, um, as examples of how people try to twist and get around all of that. And isn't that what Peter said about some things, you know, said there are some things in scripture, you know, some things that Paul wrote that are difficult to understand. And he said the unlearned twist those to their own destruction. But these people that are, are being quoted here, don't, they're not unlearned. They're, you know, uh, people that are the main uh, commentators out there. For, for the, so it's, just, it's just amazing to me that if you just took a poll out here of all people who claim to be of some uh, Christian viewpoint, they would believe once you're saved, always saved. And if you fall away, you weren't saved to begin with. But look how he describes these people. And this is at least what Albert Barnes uh, concludes, that they were true Christians. But he describes them, they were once enlightened, so did they know the word. They tasted the heavenly gift. That is, they are partakers and sharers in that heavenly gift or heavenly calling. And have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. When, who, who is that describing? Didn't we, when we were baptized, receive the Holy Spirit? And uh, didn't Paul tell Christians in Ephesus that they were 
sealed with the Holy Spirit. So he's talking here about, yeah, only Christians uh, are being talked about here. And they were once obedient, weren't they? And then it says, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. They, their awareness of, of the good and basically, <coughs> if they fall away, that is commit apostasy. If they fall short, now, uh, if they fall totally away, now we can fall, there's a difference between falling short and falling away. We can come short and you can help me, can't you? But if I'm all the way up, and this is a scary thing in, in, to think about, too. It says, if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Because what did they do? They crucified, yeah. They crucified the Son of God. And there, there's a song that I was wanting to uh, and some, I'm not going to lead it. Don't worry about it. You, oh, I was going to tell y'all that Jean Coffey is really sick uh, with, uh, she had a stomach virus. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, uh, I want to find this. It's hard, hard to find <coughs> things in this, uh, the index of this Bible, of uh, this songbook, because it's uh, dry cut. Let's see. Okay, 573, 573. Yeah, uh, and probably you are aware of this, but shall I crucify my Savior? Because that's what it says here, that that's what we do when we totally fall away. Uh, when for me he bore much, such loss, shall I put to shame my Savior? Can I nail him to the cross? Are temptations so alluring, do earth's pleasures so enthrall, that I cannot love my Savior well enough to leave them all? Twas my sins that crucified him, shall they crucify him yet? Blackest day of nameless anguish, can my thankless soul forget? Oh, the kindly hands of Jesus, pouring blessings on all men. Bleeding nail-scarred hands of Jesus, can I nail them once again? And then the chorus, shall I crucify my Savior, crucify my Lord again? Once, oh, once I crucify me, shall I crucify again? And that's just a, uh, making the, the point in a poetic way of what we do when we go astray. And go completely astray. I mean, just leave him uh, because here in verse 6, it, you crucify him again and you put him to an open shame. That is, you hold that sacrifice in contempt. You hold that sacrifice in contempt. Uh, and you repudiate all of the help that God has given you. Uh, and I have a notation down here, and I think I, I, I've forgotten where, who said this before I did, but I just wrote it down here. God gave the best. If that won't hold you in Christ, nothing will. God gave the very best. And if that won't hold you in Christ, nothing will. Uh, and then, some of you are familiar with this, and I didn't mark it. I was going to. Uh, uh, in, uh, it's either First or Second Thessalonians, and this is another thing that is uh, where it says uh, about if you don't love the truth. Where is it? I've got it marked. Let's 
that you, you are aware of it. I think, because I used to hear this preached all the time uh, when I was growing up. Oh, yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, and he's talking here, well, we start in verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that sounds awful about God. He'll send you. Now, it, isn't that what Paul said about God over in Romans chapters 1 and 2? That people wanted to go far, far away from God, and he let them. We have free will. And so God gave them over to that. And if we don't love the truth, God will give us over to that. Is it easy to love the truth? All the time. <laughs> Not always, yeah. Because sometimes the truth make division in your family or in friendship. Or in your own life. Or down yeah, in your own life. I, I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it can in your own life. Because it, mm -hmm. it can be painful to realize you know, I need to make some changes and some big changes. Some of that discipline that God. Yeah, yeah, has. yeah. That that discipline that God has for us, and we here, none of us here, want to be those who would fall away. But we also want to help our friends and family who think in that direction. Uh, and then loving the truth and wanting to stay in Christ. Yeah, God gave the best, and as I said here, if that won't hold you in Christ, nothing will. But what about our giving then back to God? If he gave us the best, what should we do? Yeah. Give our best. And that's a challenge every day, isn't it? It's a challenge every day to give our best. Sarah? Them. Yeah? Um, you kind of mentioned this a while ago. I thought when I first heard that about the elect, mm -hmm. are they no longer subject to temptation by the devil? <laughs> Do they ever have to pray to God to help them? If they're, if they're so perfect to be elect, they don't have to worry about it. How, how yeah. can that be? Yeah, there are a lot of things that when you get right down and think about it, Just a, don't make sense. But, but like you and I were talking before class, it seems simple to us sometimes. <laughs> but when you have been steeped in that concept, for so long, it can be really, really hard to unravel all of that and to, to uh, see uh, that. And uh, I know I, uh, not everybody, uh, it, it's amazing to me sometimes when I, when I look back, uh, and I know of some people that have to really struggle with their uh, what they were taught as young people or what they've been taught in their family or growing up, and they really have to struggle with that to come to Christ. And then I think about, uh, about Gary sometimes. He, he just said, 
what the Bible says, there's just one church, I guess there's just one church. <laughs> yeah. It was just like he was he was honest and open to to truth. And some people are, and they'll just turn and say, you know, huh, I was freckled when I was a baby. I guess that wasn't baptism. Yeah, that's right. You know. And some people are really open to truth like that. Mm -hmm. Even at great cost, because it, it, it was costly, as I mentioned, I think last week. There was, there was some cost to that. And some people are really open. And then some people struggle and struggle and struggle, and then finally come uh, to, uh, to uh, the truth. But, uh, but I like this. Uh, I like this uh, over on the, in verse 9. So I say over on the next page in my Bible, it's on the next page. <laughs> but, but notice what he says after talking about, oh, I forgot to mention this right down here. It's ver verses 7 and 8. It talks about the earth drinking in, you know, the God nourishes the earth, and some parts of the earth bring forth good stuff, and some parts of the earth bring forth what? Briars and thorns and so and has to be rejected. Yeah. Uh, it reminds you of the parable of the sower, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and the ground that can grow thorns could also grow good stuff. They just chose to grow thorns, you know. In fact, that uh, I don't know who what was it. Who, this was years ago. Uh, you know, we say cultivate a crop mm -hmm. and cultivate a friendship, cultivate your marriage. You know, we use that term a lot. And why do we use that term? You don't have to cultivate weeds, do you? No. no. <laughs> weeds will grow of their own accord. But uh, the garden out here, and, and John's always talking about his garden. Do you ever work in that garden? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's always, but you know, in his Motivation Monday, a lot of times he, he goes to, to the garden then. The garden. Yeah, and I, I was like, uh, yeah, I, I grew up around all that stuff. And it almost made me want to garden again. And then I thought, no, it's <laughs> And you have to take care of it. But you do have to cultivate. Mm -hmm. And because we can grow of their own accord. And that's the same thing that's true in our lives. And like you were asking about the, you know, the elect. Do you, they have to pray? Do they, you know? Uh, uh, weeds will grow of their own accord in our lives and in our relationship with one another. And in our marriage, weeds will grow. And sometimes what do we have to do? We have to cultivate. And we have to pull out those weeds. And uh, so uh, I, I think it's, it was just interesting that he used that kind of, uh, of uh, comparison there uh, about uh, the weeds growing and thorns and being rejected. But then in verse 9, he says, and, and I like this, and it reminds me always of Brother Teddy when I read this. He says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown for his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And we're going to see uh, examples of those over in chapter 11. But isn't that interesting because he's, he's hammered on this so many times, you know, don't go back. Don't lose that rest. And then he talks about, you know, just really apostatizing how, how awful that is and what that entails. And then he says here, so we're confident of better things of you. And I say that to you guys. And we've talked a lot about the things that, that we need to do 
in our lives, but I'm confident of better things for you. And don't we do that with our children sometimes when we have to discipline them or warn them about some things or, or help them through some things in his side. But I know, I know we will do better. Yeah. Uh, there's also another scripture that would um, deny this uh, elect thing is uh, Revelation 2, 10 or 2, 19, I can't remember the verse in there, uh, where it says, be faithful unto death. death. Yeah, that's 2, 10. Well, if you're yeah. an elect and mm -hmm. you don't have anything to worry about, you don't, you don't have to uh, repent or anything. Mm -hmm. How can you be, re you know, can they, how can you live like that till your death? Be faithful unto death. Yeah. I guess. I mean, why did, did, well, why would he say that? Yeah, why would he say that? Yeah, why would he say that? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, that's what we, all, all these warnings just uh, mm -hmm. out there. Uh, but again, when you have been <coughs> steeped in that, and I, I mentioned this, I, I think it was in the, uh, I think it was in the uh, Methodist class that some of us did on Thursday night that during the pandemic that I mentioned this, but uh, it may not have been. Uh, it may have been some other time I may have mentioned it in here. I don't know. Uh, but I remember when I was a, a teenager, uh, you know, that uh, the Baptists in particular in our community were, say, uh, were going around, you know, in, on campaign, knocking doors and all like this, and they'd say, are you saved? Well, you know what we were told to answer? Yeah. We were told to answer, no, uh, I, I can't know for sure that I'm saved until the end. You know, there might be something in my life that and, you know, we were told to say basically that we don't know. And I always had, I, you know, I always kind of struggled with that as a, a teenager. And I was thinking, well, if I don't know, why was I baptized? Mm -hmm. but, but, then, but then it was explained this way. If we always knew we were saved, you know, that, that then we wouldn't be aware of all this stuff. And then I, I heard some preacher say one time later, said, don't trade your insecurity for, <laughs> you know, don't, don't get a Baptist friend to trade his security for your insecurity. You know, if you can't know that you are saved. And yet there are people, even good people still, that that don't really have that assurance. And if we can't have that assurance, there's a sweet little lady, uh, Jean Newmiller, over in uh, at Decatur Avenue, Nell, who always had her hair so pretty, and you know, and I, I used to tell her I, I wanted to be like her when I grew up, because she always looked just perfect. And uh, anyway, she, uh, when she was really ill and not going to be able to live very long. Uh, her uh, her daughter, uh, you know, was uh, coming to church during that time because she'd been staying with her and all like this. And she said, I'm really concerned about Mother because I, I, I was there in the hospital and I told her, you know, Mother, it's okay. You're, you're going to your rest. You'll be in heaven. It's okay. You're safe. And her mother was saying to her, there may be some sin that I don't know about, that I haven't repented of, that's going to keep me out of heaven. And this woman had been so faithful all through her life. Mm -hmm. And and I, I and yet I know what I know the preaching she had heard because I had heard it. Mm -hmm. What kept Moses out of the promised land? Yeah. One act of disobedience, right? He struck the rock. One, but did that keep him out of heaven? And 
Johnny used to ask me that. Mommy, is Moses here? Did Moses go to heaven? Yes, that one act of disobedience, and it wasn't just that you struck the rock. God said you didn't honor me mm -hmm. <laughs> among the people. Moses got to see the land. He just didn't get to go in. He just didn't get to go in. But the more I thought about that and the fact that where, who was then, how, how do you reconcile? Who, who was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses. Moses. Moses didn't get to go into the land, but he, out on Mount Nebo, saw the purpose of that land. He saw what God was planning to do with that land. And he saw more probably there, and this is just my opinion, okay? So take it for what it's worth, but which may not be much, but, but he saw more than those who entered the land. Because he saw God and what God was purposing and planning. Just like when he was on the mountain, and, and we'll get to this later, but in building the tabernacle. And we'll talk about this more. But he saw the heavenly things that the tabernacle was just a pattern for. So, but I, and you see, I always had trouble with that as a kid. He didn't go to the promised land, so he wasn't saved, you know, was basically what was what was being communicated. But here he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And I was like, really? It, it, it seemed it, it didn't fit together. And and then a few, that is how many were saved in the ark? Eight. <laughs> Eight souls. Well, what was the world like then anyway? You know, uh, um, but but it was preached and preached and preached that one unrepented of sin could keep you out of heaven. But that was preached and drilled into my head so much that it took me a long time to to really uh, to understand. You know what? You know I've read First John, read it a. I don't know how many times, but, but to understand, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, his blood cleanses us. Yeah. I, it just took me a long time to really grasp that because of the, yeah. Well, I was thinking, you know, like we were in the, the last passage about him, him being crucified again. I was thinking about the song that we often sing, that does he still feel the nails? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, well, I grew up singing that song, and it says, you still feel the nails every time I fail. Mm -hmm. And the song doesn't answer the question. It just puts the question out there. And I always thought the, point, the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the okay. song's designed to elicit this emotional response that, yes, mm -hmm. every time I fail, I'm crucifying them. But when we were in Hawaii last year, they led a third verse to that. that said, no, I don't feel the nails. I, I died for you. I, you know, that's why I came. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that goes along so perfectly with this because he doesn't say that he would crucify him every time. That we say that. Mm -hmm. It's when we go away. Yeah, when we go totally away and, and hold him in contempt. Yeah. 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 That, you know, we have that father child relationship mm -hmm. that I, our really, my relationship with my kids doesn't end every time they. Messed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there could come a point that as adults they say, I don't want this anymore. Right. Oh. And that's their choice. It doesn't stop yeah. from loving them, but it does stop right. a relationship. Right. right. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's, uh, and, and I think I remember you saying something about that when I, uh, on what, in one of the classes we went together or something. Uh, maybe in that mess that is class. It's so obsessed with me because it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I hadn't because thought about the answer. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. No, not every time. Right, right. And, but the, that was kind of the, uh, and sometimes that's kind of the thing that can be communicated, you know, uh, and, and that's uh, 
one of those things that we, and we need to be aware that kids pick up on a lot of stuff that maybe we don't, uh, uh, we don't uh, understand. It. But can someone who has gone away be brought back? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Julie is up there saying, mm -hmm, because she is the one who was brought back. And and some of you know people who uh, have been brought back. I, I I still remember tears being shed at the little congregation where I grew up when Marvin Ludwell, who had been a drunk half his life, came back to the Lord. He grew up in the church. He used to sing beautifully with, you know. But yes, someone can come back. So, and it seemed like it seemed like to some of us that he had, you know, that he had gone so far he couldn't come back. In fact, I remember my mother telling me when her grandfather died, and her grandfather was a, a wonderful man, a, a preacher, and a, 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 when when preachers preached for, uh, you know. A, dozen eggs and a chicken or something <laughs> in small congregations around and all like that. And he died at a rather early death. And mother said that when she got the news, she just sat on the floor and cried and screamed, God, why couldn't you have taken Marvin Luttrell down there? He was a drunk and worthless. Why did you have to take my grandfather? And my brother was just a little tight. I, I I was I think I was I was preschool when great grandmother died. I just barely remember that much. So my brother was you know about three years older than I am, and my brother said to her, "What? Well, why are you so upset, mother? He's in heaven, isn't he?" And then she said she realized that it was her loss that she was. And not his gain that she was thinking about. So children can teach us some things too. Yeah, but but you know we can. People can come back. So we shouldn't use this to uh, to say, well, they've gone so far they can't come back. People can come back. That is the danger uh, of slipping away. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to remember because you can get to that point. Right. And right. we don't want that to happen to anyone or yourself especially. Yeah, yeah. And I had an uncle that I, I don't know if in the last year of his life when he was really facing death that he made a change or anything, but uh, I spent one weekend with him and he wouldn't take me to church that Sunday morning. And the Skillman Avenue Church was just a few, you know, was too far for me to walk, but, you know, he, he could have easily taken me, and he wouldn't take me to church. So I showed him, I stayed in the den and read the Bible all Sunday afternoon, and I thought, okay, you're not good. And, uh, uh, and anyway, uh, later that day, he, he called me sis all the time. He said, sis, look, I, I know I'm going to hell. You don't need to. If you know, why don't you? <laughs> and uh, but th this this can happen, but as the Hebrew writer says here, we are confident of, of better things than you. And as I say, I always think of Brother Chadley on that because he he would say when he was teaching or preaching, you know, when he had to preach a really difficult sermon, he he would always say, but. I know you'll do better. You know, he always uh, put that motivation in there in a, in a positive sort of way. And that, that is a good thing, you know, uh, with uh, uh, preachers, with teachers, with our children. And, and I think most of the time, yeah, I'm trying to remember, did I do that with my kids? I think I did most of the time. Uh, because I, you know, wanted them to. To, to know, and we always, when we had to discipline them, we always say we still love them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with every, we still love them. And uh, okay, uh, 
Yeah, it's, oh, good grief, it's time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my talking watch. Uh, as I told you all one day in statistics class, I accidentally bumped the thing and it said, did you understand? I didn't understand that. <laughs> Most of them probably didn't either. Uh, but let's have a closing song, and next time we will discuss uh, 13 and following, but, and that will get us into chapter 7 and 8, at where we're going to get down and dig into some really, uh, some really good, good, good stuff. He's been warning us all the way through here, don't lose your rest, don't lose your salvation, uh, and keep going, and then we'll... Uh, Get into the other. He says, 14, question of angle, we'll just do the first one. I think I was familiar today. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his what a glory we shed on our way. Why we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. <clears throat>